With everything we're seeing in the Middle East right now, many people are asking how much of this is religiously motivated. With Islam being the dominant religion in the Eastern world and Christianity in the West, is this a war of religions? What do Muslims actually believe? And how are the radicals we see in Hamas and other terrorist groups straying from the teachings of the Quran and Hadith, or are they actually the most devout followers? We're going to be talking about all of that and more on today's episode of Theology on Air. Well, welcome back to Theology on Air. We are, of course, an offshoot of Theology by the Pint, which is a ministry here in Houston to everybody that wants to come talk about controversial things over good craft beer. Who doesn't want to do that? Um, we have a lot of fun in our live events, but of course, we get to go even deeper here in Theology on Air in the podcast. And so I am Sarah Stone. I'm the executive director for Theology by the Pint, joined, as usual, by Evan McClanahan, senior pastor at First Lutheran here in Midtown. Um, and today, our very special guest, first time, although we've been friends for a long time, uh, is Bill Scott. Bill Scott works for Ratio Christi, and he's he runs in some of the same circles as us, but it's the first time he's here. I'll have him introduce himself a little bit more here in just a second, but excited about our conversation today. But of course, if you like what you're hearing, if if you want to hear more about this kind of stuff, um, go and subscribe and tell a friend and share the podcast and subscribe on YouTube and do all the things. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all of... Oh, and if you want to come to any of our events and you want to know what we have going on, check out theologybythepint.org, theologybythepint.org. You can stalk our leadership and you can come to stuff and tell us all your thoughts on everything. But we're going to get to this today. Bill, before we get into Islam and the Middle East and everything that's happening, first, just tell people a little bit about who you are, your story, like in a nutshell, who's Bill Scott? Well, (laughs) I am... um that was an accent on the southern accent. Yeah, on, the accent on the southern accent. Now, I, you may notice Bill has a, a pretty thick southern accent. Yeah, I sound like a I sound like a cast iron skillet with cornbread in it when I talk. <laughs> or I, I heard one of my friends say, um, "I hate hearing myself recorded because every time I listen to the playback, I sound like a bale of hay." <laughs> so, oh, well, <laughs> so, I no, think it's but, endearing. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm so yeah. The accent is Eastern Kentucky. I was actually, and when I talk to my Muslim friends, I say, you know, anywhere anybody I talk to globally, I'm like, well, as far as the global spectrum goes, I don't know that I could talk about, you know, I don't know how Eastern Kentucky has impacted people globally, except <laughs> I was born in a hospital that was two hours north of the very first Kentucky Fried Chicken. Woo. Now that's a global thing. So <laughs> it's a global thing. Everybody likes. Fried I've chicken. eaten KFC in Nairobi, Kenya before, so it's definitely a global. That's thing. cute. But um, but yeah, no. So so as far as like what we're talking about today, this actually has pretty deep roots with me because that said, I was raised in a town in eastern Kentucky where it's like ninety-seven percent white people. I only know that because I have an apologetics presentation that says like I had to find that stat. Mm-hmm. So there we are. But I was blessed to be raised in a neighborhood that had this. It was the only diverse neighborhood that I know of, really, mm-hmm. in in that part of in that town. I had Japanese neighbors, and I had neighbors from Syria growing yeah. up. And so, when I was young, like eleven, twelve years old, growing up in a secular home, not a Christian home, um, we were interacting with these Syrian neighbors that were super sweet. I mean, they were eating Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner with us and mm-hmm. trading presents. And we were babysitting their little their little kid, Hamoudi, would come over and, and, and hang out. And it, it was yeah. really cool. Um, and then fast forward a few years later, I was a senior at high, in high school, um, 9 o'clock in the morning, the Twin Towers got hit and radically changed mm-hmm. the way a lot of us thought about Islam. And so as a... As then an atheist, you know, I became a Christian much later. I didn't really give religion a whole lot of thought, but of course, um, I'm ashamed to admit, that, you know, I kind of got on that bandwagon of, you know, this is this is like a religious war, or it's mm-hmm. not even a religious war. It's like we got to take out these people and mm-hmm. all this stuff. And They're my, bad. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had a lot of friends going to the going to the the Middle East and coming back and being changed forever. And so that was just part of my generation. It wasn't until I, I actually got saved at 26 years old, um, had failed out of college. I had about six years of, of uh, an undergrad getting ready to graduate with a history legal studies. I was going to go on to law school. Long story short, um, got in some trouble, got, a, you know, got one of those kind of testimonies won't go into it right now, but 
It's uh, spicy though. You yeah, should stick it, around and hear yeah. it. Yeah. Well, well, to make a long story short, you know, drugs, alcohol, jail, got saved in jail, got out, and apologetics immediately became like this is got to be part of my discipleship coming from atheism, agnosticism. At that time I was trying to do Buddhism and I had all these other isms <laughs> and <laughs> going on. And um, was very leftist, very like out there kind of person. So as soon as I become a Christian, apologetics played a very integral role in my discipleship. Mm -hmm. So fast forward a few years after that, I went back to school, graduated from the prestigious, and I mean that word, very, uh, very true. It's a very prestigious college called Kentucky Mountain Bible College. Kentucky Mountain Isn't Bible College. Isn't that awesome? Sounds like the name of a country song. Oh, it, I love I, it. Actually, it is. I'm just joking. Okay. So, no. I was like, what? Okay. It's, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, but I'm okay with that. I mean, it, like, really, that was a great school. I got a great um, biblical and theological foundation there. It was a very small school, so I'm sitting here studying with these expert guys that were kind of like missionaries to Eastern Kentucky to plant mm. this little college. And everybody that taught there was not from Eastern Kentucky. They were just like, they just had a, a heart for that kind of ministry. And we're sitting there learning Bible with like f five people in the classrooms. So it was a very intense education. And I was very That's thankful cool. for it. And then I planted a church with my sweet wife and then I drug my sweet wife down here to Houston to do a master's degree in apologetics. So, and we're glad that you did. Yeah. So we went, we left a town of 1,200 people, and here we are in Houston, Texas. But a few I, more. Yeah, there's a few more people here, which I like that. So um, one of the things that I did almost immediately, one of the things I noticed almost immediately was how diverse this place was. Yeah. And that's why I was attracted to it. I didn't know exactly what God was going to do with all that, but... My scene, I should have seen it coming because my senior paper in my undergrad was about Islam. Then I come down here, and I'm like, oh, wow, there's more mosques and temples in my part of town than there are mm -hmm. uh, churches. So this is this is fun. What a great place to, to work on apologetics. So yeah. um, while I was going through the program at HCU, we didn't have a major world religions emphasis, but we did have a world religions um, class that we got to take and, and it was really enlightening. And then we went from there, I went from there to starting to study with, um, the, um, Houston center or the center for Muslim and Christian studies at, at Houston, which has a very cool story. Um, we don't have time for all the details of it, but actually started in Oxford. So it was usually originally Houston uh, or the center for Muslim and Christian studies at Oxford. And then they moved over here of all places to start a second group and then they're hmm. they're actually looking at another place in the middle east right now and this is where you go once a week yeah and you visit with folks that are muslim and i guess some other christians and you're studying arabic and yeah it's a fascinating place my arabic teacher was actually a visiting lecturer at baylor he's got his phd in in islamic studies he's from amman jordan and um and you know, we're studying Quran and Bible. We'll take an hour and look at the Quran and an hour and look at the Bible, ideally. I mean, sometimes we're just, there's too much to do in one sure. hour. But, yeah, every Thursday night, I've, I've really, um, it's really helped me to see, you know, um, more deeply into that culture and more deeply into that world. Because when you're studying with... Um, you know, one of my one of my friends. You know, he's a Pakistani that who who's been here in the United States for thirty years, working in the oil and gas industry, and and um, he's he's about to retire and go get his PhD in Islamic studies. And where it's like that level of of thinkers about this stuff, like you can't be sloppy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as, as a Christian, you you got to know your views well. You got to know their views well. You got to know who you're talking to. So it's really helped me to to understand um, Islam. Pretty deeply. Well, that's and, why we asked you to come in today. Because, yeah. um, okay, I mean, so the time, go ahead. To be fair, not as deep as many of the people as I know either. I feel pretty unqualified. I know. Bill kept saying there are other experts, but, <laughs> but we like you and we want to hear from you. And, and we have done episodes before on Islam. We've had Andy Bannister and others mm -hmm. come on and talk, and, and you can go back and you can listen to those. But, and I suggest that too. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Andy Bannister's book is really good. Mm -hmm. Um, but, the reason why I wanted to do this today is because I knew you've been kind of in this world at this time. Yeah. So at the time of recording this, this is early December 2023 and, you know, October 7th, the Hamas attack on Israel happened. And now, you know, there's this war between Israel and Hamas, a lot of it in the Gaza Strip. And then people all over the world are kind of losing their minds, trying to figure out what's going on. What do they believe? Who are they for? You know, people are like they're either for Israel or they're for Palestine, which is mm -hmm. anyway, a uh, maybe a little bit of a false dichotomy, but, um, 
I think we talk a lot about the politics of it and about the, you know, the terrorism and this army and that army, but there is a religious, it's not just an undertone. There is a religious war happening here. And then of course the politics on and the geopolitics on top of that. Okay. So I thought it might be good to give people a little bit of a primer on Islam, um, especially how does that get into the sort of extremist uh, sure. Islam and then how is it different Christianity? And then how is it, we're going to try to do all this in an hour. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> so we're going to rapid fire this thing, but let's just start with everybody keeps saying like, well, let's look at the history of the land. I don't want to look at the history of the land. You can go look that up on YouTube. I want to look at the history of the religions. Okay. So let's start by just talking about like, where did Islam come from? And is it connected at all to any characters in the Judeo Christian scripture? Yeah. Um, so in present day Saudi Arabia, there lived a man named Muhammad. Okay. <laughs> so, it sounds like the beginning of Lord of the Rings. That long, long ago. <laughs> or Star Wars, yeah. In yeah. a galaxy far, far away. Who was an interesting character? Um, who Give us a time frame. Muhammad came on the scene in what, like about six ten AD is when the okay. when the Quran started being yeah. okay. um, um, you know, around is that just when it's, he started apprehending these these visions. Okay. So interesting guy. He was a he was a um just as a person of history, I, f I find Muhammad to be very interesting because he, um, first of all, he wasn't an idiot. I don't think he was an idiot. <laughs> no, a I lot don't of, either. A lot of people try to like mischaracterize him. Um, I, I think by, by saying that like he, you know, he was illiterate. I was like, well, most of the world and that, that part of the world was illiterate. And that doesn't but, mean that you're unintelligent. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't mean you're unintelligent. So, but it was true that he was illiterate and he was apprehending these visions. And here's a guy who, you know, lost both his parents that were raised by his um, aunt and uncle that married a, a, a wife that was 15 years older than him when she stayed faithful up until her death, you know, mm. um, which is why a lot of Muslims see him as like a guy with high moral character and humility. And, mm -hmm. if you, and you know, and I was um, listening to some Harvard lectures about the, about the um, biography of Muhammad and who he was. And he's often characterized, and this is from a secular historical perspective that he was, you know, a caring man that was good with kids and, and things like that. Like there's I'm resisting that. <laughs> the jokes here. Okay. <laughs> Real good with some kids. Hey Sorry. Now. Hey okay. now. All right. So he, you know, so there was like, there's that, like this kind of, of guy, but like the reality of it is whenever he, he started getting these visions and, um, at first he was very troubled. Mm -hmm. I mean, about like this vision that he had in, you know, in the cave that he'd supposedly gotten from Gabriel. And uh, from the angel, which they refer to, angel Gabriel, which they refer to as, well, they think is the Holy Spirit, you know, the spirit mm. of Allah, they call, you mm. know, which um, we can get to that later. But so long story short, like he, you know, he was a trader. He, you know, he obviously like not traitor. D. Trader. He tra traded. As, yeah, he yes. traded and he was a merchant. So um, that tells me that he had a lot of interaction with a lot of different kinds of people. And mm -hmm. there were a lot of Christians in that part of the world at mm -hmm. that time, a lot of Jewish people in that time of the world, in that part of the world at that time. And so I think it, I think that kind of um, helps me at least as I'm studying this to understand the perspective of him uh, bringing up all these Christian figures in the Quran. Cause a lot of people mm -hmm. don't realize that the Quran mentions Jesus out, out of the, Isa. I think the, yeah, Isa. Um, I want to say in 19 different chapters of the Quran, Jesus mentioned. So it's real quick, major, the, oh, excuse me. The Quran is the holy book, at least the, the yeah, main one yeah, it's that the, he yeah. wrote slash dictated that he got from this angel. Uh -huh. We'll put that in quotes. Um, but th that's what he said, an angel mm -hmm. that met with him multiple times in this cave in modern day Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and the and the Quran means the recitation. So these okay. these things are being um, given to Muhammad. Then he's reciting them to scribes, and the scribes are writing them down. Okay, and so because um, there there is an importance to him being illiterate because it could not have been his own writings. That's the mm -hmm. one of the yeah. proof texts. Yeah, right? it was. So he's yeah, illiterate, I, so he's just he's the middleman. He's yeah, he's yeah. just the the hand with the pen or whatever. Yeah, and it's just kind of assumed that yeah he he was yeah exactly he was the middleman and I. But doesn't that immediately put a really high burden that everything in the Quran therefore must be one hundred percent accurate if it's, it's from God? That's very that's very fair. I mean, I, that's one of the things as an apologist that I see all the time. To be honest, is that there is a 
there is a lot of these kind of high burdens of proof that I think, you know, I think the the everyday thinking Muslim has to grapple with to, to really substantiate the claims of some of these these things because you're you know, saying they have set the standard so high that the average Muslim or that Islam itself kind of they they I'll put it like this have they painted themselves into a corner on some issues or well know? Evan I would say it like this that they they've painted their they've they've set the standard so high that it almost takes to me it's a blind faith to to believe it i mean really yeah. that and that's i think that's a very and they're and most muslims i know are okay with that okay with mm -hmm. saying that um they're like well yeah that's what faith is right you believe that the quran is true and so when you start talking about the quran i mean like a lot of people try to equivocate i think and this is my personal opinion when we try to equivocate jesus and muhammad we're not asking the right question yeah that's apples and oranges yeah i think we need to ask like jesus versus the quran because hmm. jesus is the final Mm -hmm. revelation of God to us. Hmm. He is the word made flesh. So it's authority versus authority. Yeah. And I'm not, not saying, person versus person. and I'm not trying to say that a Muslim would believe that the Quran is God because they would not. They no. would say that's blasphemy. And we say Jesus is God. I'm saying as far as the revelation of man, yeah. the revelation of God to man, to man, that's the Quran. And so when, so like us, if Jesus said it, that settles it. Read the Sermon on the Mount if you've got a got a problem with this ethical issue. It's, if it's addressed in the Sermon on the Mount, I'm not going to question what Jesus said. Same way with the Quran, you know. So the Quran is unquestionably God's final revelation to man. If the Quran said it, it might sound ir totally irrational. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't because have it's, to be rational. It's, yeah. Who are you to you know? Who are you to question God? You know. So it's like at some point. The philosophical arguments just don't, they just bounce off people because it's just like, it, you know, it's just not, in my, my perspective, like the philosophical arguments are just always going to fall short trying to reach Muslims because at the end of the day, it's not a philosophical argument they're looking for. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like the Quran said it, who am I to question? Well, and, and today's episode, I don't really so much want to get into the philosophy of where things fall short. We're not trying to disprove Islam. I actually exactly. think it's pretty yeah. easy to do that. Um, what I want to do is understand it, compare yeah. it to Christianity, and then take a look at what people are taking from the Quran and the Hadith, which we haven't even gotten to yet. But, yeah. but before we do, so you gave us just a glimpse of Muhammad, but that's 610 AD. For many hundreds of years before that, there were Arabic people. Yeah. Um, and some people will say that Islam really found its roots in a character named Ishmael. Who we've mm -hmm. read, we read about in in our Bible in the Old Testament, Jewish people in their Hebrew scriptures, as the 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 sort of illegitimate son of Abraham, where he tried to skirt God's way of doing things, and he had his handmaiden have sex with them instead mm -hmm. of his wife. And they had this kid Ishmael, who poor, I mean, poor Ishmael. He is a sort of a sad character in the Bible, yeah. who the Bible talks about how he's going to be in charge of a lot of not in charge, but the father of a lot of people who are going to have troubles. How does that yeah. connect? Well, it, you know, it, it connects – well, if you go back further than Ishmael, first, first of all, we do have um, this in common with Muslims. They see the father of their faith as being Abraham. So right. Ibrahim is what they mm -hmm. would, would call um, Abraham. Um, so much so that I actually had a very interesting interaction at a, at a um, iftar a few years ago, which is a, a Ramadan holy dinner. You yeah, know. breaking the fast. Yeah, to um, – where one of my Muslim friends asked me, you know, they were there's a there's a point during Ramadan where they're asking like, God give me a vision, God give me it's this power week of power I think mm -hmm. they call it, the final week of Ramadan, and so they're praying and fasting and asking God to give them visions and he said, Brother Bill, I have this vision that Allah has been giving me all week and it's the vision of a sentence, and I don't understand it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. This guy never read the Bible. He's like, correct me if I'm wrong, but is, doesn't the Bible call Ibrahim Abraham? He said, mm -hmm. yeah. He said, that's very interesting. And he kind of got silent for a minute. He said, so is this anywhere in the Bible? Before Abraham was, I am. Ooh. I was like, sure. And I'm sitting here looking at this. I'm like the only, like one of the only two Christians, me and my mm -hmm. other buddy was there, in this whole room full of Muslims. And I'm like, He's like, can you, I'm like, yeah, it's definitely in the Bible. And he's mm -hmm. like, is it really? Can you explain this to me? And he just had to know. I'm like, here? 
now. Yes. <laughs> and so I explained it to him. And, you know, here's a guy that hadn't eaten all day that just like oh. you could tell he was just almost lost his appetite. He just looked down. And so Abraham is a very central figure to them. And then secondly is Ishmael. And so Ishmael, yeah, of course, there's, you know, we know what the Bible says about Ishmael. The Quran paints him a little bit differently. But, but you know, um, it's also significant that there are like Muslim legends of Hmm. The Kaaba being built. What's the Kaaba? Hey guys, Sarah here. Sorry to interrupt what I'm sure is an amazing podcast episode, but I just wanted to tell you that Theology by the Pint is growing. We are now a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we're expanding. This coming year, with your help, we'll grow our reach by adding events in multiple Houston suburbs as well as launch a youth version. Don't worry, those will be pints of iced coffee, not beer. Uh, we're adding follow-up conversations to reach the spiritually curious and the unchurched. We're also growing our connections and partnerships with more local churches. And you can help us grow by praying for us, by telling your friends or church about us, and of course, by partnering with us financially. To donate, go to theologybythepint.org forward slash give. You know, if each of our podcast listeners gave $100, we would reach our annual budget right then. Consider donating today. Okay, enjoy the rest of the show. It was the holy cube cube yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. in Mecca that people walk around. The black thing. Actually, it's a, actually there's a Kaaba um, emoji on Facebook. Oh, funny! You can find that. Like just mm. just type it in. <laughs> there's a, yeah, and it's and I, the first time I saw it, I was like, but it's a building. Yeah, it's a building that people can walk around. It was yeah. um, it's like a tomb. It was the place that held pagan deities, um, okay. and that's Islamic history. Okay. Like the, it held, it was a, it was a, most likely a rock that they believe that has been given by God. It looked like it was carved, probably carved from like a meteorite or something. It is a very unique mm -hmm. thing, and you can Google this thing and look at it. Yeah, and there's and, like a twenty four seven live stream too. So there's yeah, you can people watch make people, pilgrimage to it. Yeah, you know that's when we when we say Mecca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so a bunch people, of people in white walking around. Yeah. So yeah, th so this thing used to house like 350 deities before Muhammad came on the scene. And um, when Muhammad um, took over Mecca, when he con made the the Meccan conquest, he abolished all of the, the pagan idols out of um, the Kaaba and dedicated it to Allah. But the interesting history of the Kaaba is there's a lot of good history that says this thing was actually built in Petra and then brought to Yikes. Mecca. And then uh -huh. there's a lot of Muslim history that says that um, there's popular popular Muslim idea that the Kaaba was built by Ishmael, oh, wow. and Abraham made a pilgrimage to Mecca to help build the Kaaba. So, so Abraham <laughs> came to help his illegitimate son build a building that would later be used for pagan deities, and then they'd get kicked out by Muhammad to serve Allah. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, I, I think if if you said it like that to a Muslim, they would say, yeah, these people in Mecca definitely lost their way. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, thank, uh, you know, thanks be to Allah and Muhammad, peace be upon him. He came mm -hmm. and reclaimed it in the name mm -hmm. of Allah and restored it from the pagan idols and yeah. things like that. So, and we're not going to do this today on the podcast because we don't have time, but Bill and I see that a little bit differently. We had a whole conversation yesterday about did Muhammad move people one step closer to the truth by pulling them away from all these pagan deities to a one God system and maybe we'll duke that out another time for y'all. <laughs> well, um. all I'll say about that right now is all, all that I would mean by saying did Muhammad move them one step closer to the truth? He he stopped the Arabian Peninsula from fighting among these among each other and united them under this one God idea. Yeah. And then put them into like weird took them out of weird pagan idolatry and put them into the conversation of mm -hmm. monotheism, mm -hmm. which ex excludes every religion in the world but three. Yeah. And that's all, like, epistemologically, there are problems. Relationally, there are opportunities. Sure, is the way sure, I look sure, at sure. That. So it's like that's there's nice. a conversation to be to be had here is all I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. So it's so like Jews, Christians, Muslims, we are monotheistic. The difference is Christians are uh, tripersonal, you know, Trinitarian. Yeah, you know, you know, Muslims so. don't call us monotheistic. Right. They right. would say yeah. essentially we believe in three gods. And right. We're saying, wait a minute, we distinguish between person and being. Yeah. So for the listener out there, that that that's how you can still that's how you can be monotheistic and still yeah. have pretty radical disagreements theologically. Well, but, and that's what we're about to get to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, 
Okay, so that's sort of the beginning of how things started to unfold. And, and we are not going to get into, you know, all of the sort of wars and wives and all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> let's do this, though. What are, if you had to sum up kind of the core tenets, like if someone asked me the core tenets of Christianity, I'd, of course, talk about the resurrection, about, you know, the world God created, and then it was broken, and then a Savior came, and everything will be made right one day, right? Like mm -hmm. I can kind of give the big building blocks. Do that for Islam. What are the core tenets of Islam? How does salvation work? What is Allah like? Yeah. Uh, paint us that picture. You have four minutes go. <laughs> <laughs> I think the core tenets are easy to understand. Probably don't even need four minutes. The The first and most primary thing is the Tawheed, the, that um, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. That's Peace be upon him. Yeah. And that is how you... Shouldn't keep saying that. Okay. Yeah. So that's how, that's how you... I mean, in... You know, and honestly, Muslims don't even expect you to say that to them. <laughs> like they're, they're yeah, just, yeah, yeah. As you're learning, as you're learning this stuff, it's um, it's really complicated. I mean, that, the reason Sarah keeps saying "peace be upon him" is that's part of Islam. Is like there they are these, say that about every prophet. Yeah, there's there's these like scriptural prayer type things that you say that are like respecting Muhammad. So it's just mm -hmm. like a sign of respect. They also say "peace be upon him" about Jesus, Jesus too. Yeah. So. That that's that's primary. So the primary um, is Allah is, is God. Say it again. There is no god but one, Allah, mm -hmm. and, and Muhammad, Muhammad is, is his, his, prophet, mes his messenger, messenger, which, which okay. means he's not the only messenger, but he's the final messenger. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they so, actually don't think there can be any more latter day. No, revelation. There's no more. I mean, that is the, so handy. The ones that do, the ones that that have had that, and mm -hmm. those they've came and went, and their influence is still around. Um, there are people that. I mean, those are the type of people that ISIS target first, <laughs> you know, like, those, oh, wow. like, like yeah. they're yeah, yeah. like these fringe Muslims that do, that are totally messed up. So like, don't, don't go there. Yeah. Got so, it. so then after that, you have, um, the ritual prayers of Salat, like five, five times a day mm -hmm. you have, um, um, they have a tithe, which mm -hmm. is very modest compared to ours, 2%. So, oh, I mean, listen, if people to save don't like money, Christianity. Oh, <laughs> yeah. What's this 2% business? <laughs> yeah. So, oh so yeah, that's the Sakat. Half and of our subscribers are like, I'm rethinking my religion. Yeah. And, right. and that's just, but, but beyond that, they're expected to give beyond that to other charity things. You'll see these things. Like if you go in like the Muslim marketplaces and things like over in Southwest Houston, um, like my barber shop, they have like a, a Zakat box that you can give to like, like, help orphans and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's kind of like a charity thing, like mm -hmm. give to charity. That's like, they do that. The day. iftar dinners too. A lot of times they'll yeah, collect. Yeah. Right. Like a drive. And of course, fasting is, is big for them. It's one of the, the five core tenants. And then of course the Hajj, which we talked about, which is Hajj's pilgrimage. Yeah. The pilgrimage to Mecca, which you're expected to do. Every able-bodied person's expected to do, but there is mercy for those who cannot. So, at least once in your lifetime. At least once. Okay. In your so lifetime. we've got Allah is the God, uh, Muhammad is his messenger, the tithing, the prayers, the Hajj. What am I missing? The prayers, the Hajj, the fasting. So fasting. Okay. Yeah. And we, we see the fasting, especially at Ramadan, yeah. which I used to think was the same time every year. And I realized it's based on the moon. So it actually yeah. moves, but it moves slowly. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they break the fast every day at their iftar dinner. And the end of it is one of their Eids, which is the one at the end of Ramadan is sort of like their Christmas. Like it's their big yeah. one. Yeah. Which is or which Easter. is uh which goes again back to Muhammad and Ishmael, which okay. is, or not Muhammad, but um sorry Abraham and Ishmael. You know that it's one of the things like Eid is one of the things that Christians really if, like. If you're that person sitting out there saying I want to reach my Muslim dinner have, yeah. or my Muslim <laughs> friend, have an Eid dinner because Ooh, if you tell people so delicious, yeah, and and what that is is such a neat thing. It's one of those things like I wish like. More people, not just religions, did this mm -hmm. kind of thing where your door is wide open to all mm -hmm. of your neighbors and you they come and go and eat dinner. And we do that every year at the Center for Muslim Christian Studies. And it's just a night of celebrating each other mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And it's after the sun goes down, just whoever wants to come to your yep. house and eat, you are demanded to serve them food. So they have these gigantic meals like Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, and, and in Houston, there's a big Pakistani population of Muslims, so you're going to get – Butter chicken and kebabs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so delicious. Um, well, can I can I yeah. ask what, sure. what are what are kind of the ethical teachings of? That's well, where I was going oh. next. So you're mm -hmm. great. Well, yeah. Just I mean, like say we we might point to the Ten Commandments for Hebrew scriptures and other many other aspects of God's law, and then 
Sermon on the Mount, something like that for, for Christian ethics. What is it sprinkled throughout the Quran or is it plain? Because that's one of the issues it seems like is that mm -hmm. Muslims, modern Muslims don't agree. And I know we'll mm -hmm. get to the Hadith and I yeah. might add, but anyway. Yeah. So it's a great question, Evan, because, um, you know, one of the most fascinating things I found studying this religion is I often thought the ethics were just derived from the Quran because who can question that? And really only a few of them are. Yep. Because the Quran mm -hmm. is not really, it doesn't really teach ethics. It teaches repent for the kingdom of God is near kind of like a message. You know, Sounds it's familiar. Like, yeah. I mean, they're, they're big on eschatology. I mean, right now. What is eschatology? Uh end times like doctrine okay. of the end times and and um you know and on that throne of judgment many mu muslims believe it'll be jesus on the throne of judgment mm. judging all mankind because he's the only sinless perfect prophet that has the right to judge and things like that yeah. so um even though muhammad was a prophet he was the final word they don't claim him to be sinless they knew that he had mm. flaws so yeah. well, so that so that, that, that jesus that. <laughs> jesus had a you know jesus was sinless you know to them mm. jesus was born of a virgin jesus performed miracles jesus taught with authority mm -hmm. jesus ascended into heaven and will come back one day and judge the living and the dead if you take surah 3 seriously isa was being spoken to by allah and allah tells him one day i will cast you down to die and raise you up again to me and it's mm. like some i asked I asked a Muslim the other day at Ratio Christi, um, had a you know, PhD in Islamic studies. I said, you know, there's that, there's that, uh, um, I'll get to your question in a minute. If this is interesting since we brought this up. I said, you know, that, that Mus that Islamic word there, that Arabic word there is Afwa Faka, which anytime that's ever applied to a human being means death, right? And he said, I said, so could that mean that Allah told Jesus that he would die, which they don't believe Jesus died on a cross normally. Hmm. And he said, it could be. <laughs> and that's all he said. I was like, at least there's what a chance. What do they believe that happened to Jesus? They believe he ascended into heaven without dying. Okay. So, so he about assumed. Assumed, yeah. So he so about ethics, what most of the ethics are derived from the Sunnah and Hadith. And the Sunnah came before the Hadith. They were the, they were kind of like the traditions, and then the Hadith um, talked about the how Muhammad um, responded to things. So like how we have WWJD, they have the Hadith. <laughs> okay, know? so wait, the Hadith is a series <laughs> of books and writings about, really about Muhammad's life. Yeah, several how he books lived. and writings. Yes, and over the course of a really long time, mm -hmm. right? Longer than the Quran. Yeah. I mean, well, they even have things in there about like what foot he used to enter rooms and some people that are really serious will like, Walk into rooms with their right foot because yeah. that's what Muhammad did. It gets so detailed, Sarah, that there are things in that hadith that I would not feel comfortable talking about. I was literally, well, I've listened to enough David Wood to know. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some pretty detailed things about yeah. how to do it, what like to do with certain, and, yeah. Yeah, certain bodily excre excrements and things like that on your marriage <laughs> okay, day. Okay, yeah, we don't have to get it's, into that. <laughs> but but the hadith, but it's all about that, right? I mean, is, Islam is a is a is a a religion of. God has given us, has told us what to do, so we're going to do it. Yeah. And so yeah. So the hadith is is like, okay, I'm I've the you know the Quran's very short compared to the mm -hmm. Bible. It's you know very, like half the size of the New Testament. It's or like something. the tithing. Yeah. It's <laughs> hey, <laughs> See, I never thought about that, <laughs> but it's it's it it doesn't cover everything. Like so, it's like. They're building these governments and this religion. You can't separate politics and religion. There's no separation of church and state in Islam. It's just, it's got to go together. Which we'll get to so, in a second. Yeah. So the Hadith is like, like, okay, so there's this rule for life. There's this Sharia law. There's, you know, and, and law is, that's the law handed down by, by God, by Allah. So it's like, how do we, how do we live? How do we, how do we raise our children? Mm -hmm. What do we do when we go to the bathroom? What do we do mm -hmm. when we work? What kind of food? Like, what kind of mm -hmm. food do we eat? How do we pray? And there's, you know, their whole prayer system is very ritualistic, you know, in things. That's yeah. why I've known a lot of Muslims that leave Islam and convert to something like Catholicism or some sort of high church thing because mm -hmm. they're attracted to the, the liturgy and the, the ceremony the, the ritual. ceremony of it all because it is very ceremonial because all that's spelled out. So the Hadith is like a collection of over 500,000 um, 
anything from a paragraph to a few pages mm -hmm. of how Muhammad dealt with a certain situation. And some of them carry more th authority than others. Yeah. Which we may get to, but yeah. I want to, I want to talk about, because this is going to get us into the whole jihad extremist kind of thing. Before we get there, I want to talk about how are people saved? Um, when I mean saved, I mean like spiritually, you know, into the next life kind of in both Christianity and Islam, because that I think is the real difference, which when people say, oh, we're all really worshiping the same God. Allah is just the word for God and we serve God, but they're not the same. And salvation is really kind of where you start to see that. So maybe describe how they're different and how salvation works in, all, yeah. in, in Islam and in Christianity. Well, I would say the most important distinction in Christianity, I Islam teaches bad people how bad people can be good people. Okay. Christianity teaches how dead people can be living. People. Ooh. I think that's. The say that again. Difference. That was good. That'll preach. You know, I, I really, yeah. You really want me to say it? Yeah, again? I okay. really do. Okay. I'll, I'll do what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can say it again now. But no, it's, uh, is I think Islam teaches how bad people can be good people. And Christianity teaches how dead people can be living people. It's good. Um, you know, Jesus didn't die on a cross to make bad people good. Yeah. He died on a cross to make dead people live. Yeah. And while Islam does believe in a final resurrection, just like we do, they do believe in a final judgment, just like we do. Mm -hmm. All of that looks different in Islam. Because for any honest Muslim, like one of the first things they're attracted to in my interface and working in, in reading the Bible and the Quran together, like almost every Thursday night for the past three years, I've seen over and over and over again when when I mention the Sermon on the Mount to somebody, like mm. to a Muslim, mm -hmm. they love that because they'll it's say sort of rules to live yeah, by. Yeah, they're they're yeah. like we don't see anywhere in the in the Bible where there's these where there's commands. It's like well, you really need to read the Bible because there's over a thousand commands in the New Testament. There's yeah. more commands in the New Testament than there is the Torah. <laughs> so I mean, there's it's a, they're all in there. Yeah, but it's never more clear than it is in the Sermon on the Mount. And so that's where I like to take people when hmm. they're, they're wanting to know more about that East of the, the Messiah, they call yeah. it. So for us, though, we know that we're not saved by those commands. We know that those commands are put there to have a reflection of how badly we need a Savior. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me that um, while Muslims believe that they are um, saved by their good deeds and one day that uh, Allah is going to weigh their good deeds against their bad deeds mm -hmm. on the final judgment, and the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds. That's you why hope. one of the things that the zakat is very meaningful to them because that's mm. a way that they can, you know, kind of up sense, the good ones, pay their way out of yeah. purgatory in a sense, put yeah. in their own language or something. Um, but um, but with Christianity, it's it's obviously a religion of uh, of grace, even yeah. though even though the grace of Allah is is mentioned many many times. Is and, it grace or is it mercy? They would say it's the grace of Allah, but, okay. it, but it means mercy. Right. For us, it, it means a, a gift of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing that um, one of my mentors, um, Dr. David Coffey, he does a PhD in Islamic studies um, in uh, some university in England, but I forget now. But anyway, he helped me with my thesis. He helped me over see my thesis, and I read his dissertation when I was preparing my thesis, and I, I did it in Islamic studies um, it was an apologetics thesis when I was talking about, you know, how John of Damascus used apologetics to work with Muslims and things like this. It, it, it was a very interesting study. And, and Dr. Coffey, um, you know, if I could quote him, he said, you know, he was raised in Bangladesh and he was, and I've heard him say this several times, you know, publicly that for him, it was Eid that really got him. Like when he was thinking about, do I become a Muslim with all my friends or do I become a Christian? I don't know where to go with this. And he said, ultimately, it has to be Christian because of Eid. Eid's what did it. So with huh. Eid, Eid is That's a, the celebration, the celebration yeah. we talked about with Ramadan where, you know, they're celebrating Allah prepared a sacrifice for Abraham. And Abraham made that sacrifice and saved Ishmael. It's the same story, but the, the characters are switched. Wait, wait, wait. Say it again. So in Islam, Islamic story, it goes that Abraham, say it, say it again. Let's keep in mind the context here. Eid is one of the most important yeah. Muslim holidays of the year. Yeah. And it is clearly a celebration of penal substitutionary atonement. Okay. It clearly is because here is Ishmael. Well, actually, it doesn't ever name the son. Like okay, the but they Quran. understand it to be Ishmael. But they understand it to be Ishmael. He's about to be offered as a sacrifice. And Allah, by his mercy, 
prepares a goat to be wow. sacrificed instead. So they just swap or a lamb. Out those I don't forget sides. if it's a goat or a lamb, but one of the two. Yeah. It doesn't matter the animal. If it was yeah. even a, a pigeon or a bull, yeah. but it was, but it was clearly a something took its place. So that's what's fascinating about studying with this stuff. Uh, studying with these people and studying this stuff in such a, a depth that we get to get into and talk about this stuff. It's like there are parts of it where it's like they've got a lot more light than I ever thought they did about what these things mean. And it's mm -hmm. like, and it's like, you know, Jesus dying on a cross is just a reflection of it. Yeah. Like, why, why is that not? But then when you get there, it's like, it seems like there's a wall that goes up and it's sure. like, well, but that's where the conversation ends because Jesus can't be because if Jesus is, then we have to deny the Quran, deny the Quran and shirk. And if I commit shirk, I can never be saved. It's like the worst possible sin I could do is leave the Islam. So that's why you see people like Nabil Qureshi who really took this dead serious. Mm -hmm. If you haven't heard that name before. He's fantastic. Today. He he wrote a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus that details his long-term conversion to yeah. Islam. Like it took him a long time Years. to get there. Yeah. Because he was a very devout Muslim, but he um, kept, you know, he had a, a, some good friends, some crazy good friends, <laughs> Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona and David Wood that were hanging out with him and teaching him about like how to compare these this Christian versus Islam interface thing. And eventually he said, you know, my heart was saying I have to remain a Muslim, but my mind wouldn't let me. Basically, mm. is how how that story like uh, you'll see. Well, there's see so it. much fear behind th this is this will undo your salvation. Mm -hmm. So so let me let me throw a well, couple not of things. Just in. That. But Go if ahead. a Muslim does convert, it's oh, not that they just lose their religion. No, they I know. lose everything. Yep. Your they community. lose their barbershop. They lose yep. their mosque. They lose their family. They lose their, you know, mm -hmm. like their favorite restaurant. You know, once mm -hmm. that comes out, it, it can really be detrimental, especially in the Middle East. Not so much in the United States, but yeah. especially in the Middle East. Yeah. So just to add a couple. So this idea of salvation in Islam is you hope you have more good deeds than bad deeds. And it's it's been told to me by some of my Muslim friends that you have sort of this, um, the jinn, which is sort of like <laughs> yeah. the little spirits or whatever that sit on essentially over your shoulder, on your shoulder. One is recording your good deeds. One is recording your bad deeds. At the end of every day, this sort of chapter yeah. is closed. The next day continues. And at the end of everything, you hope that your ledger has more good than bad. Yeah. But, but Allah is merciful. So there may be some wiggle room or he's like a judge at the end that might be like, ah, I, I see you really tried. Yeah. But correct me if I'm wrong. There's no guarantee. There's no, no guarantee. assurance of salvation. There's no... I can breathe a full breath today because I know that I'll be in Allah's, uh, you know, eternity. There's right. I've I've seen that. I've encountered some some Muslims and had conversations where that is kind of a, a back of the mind torment thing. Yeah. Know, where it's like, where is the assurance at the end of the day if it's all reliant upon me? And yes. And I think I think the big, I think the big difference between us and them is like. We have the freedom to learn, grow, question mm -hmm. all of these things in the present. And, and God is covering us by the blood of Jesus mm -hmm. and by the Holy Spirit and resurrecting power of the Holy Spirit. We are saved because Jesus rose from the dead. That's right. We point back to a, his, a fact of history and a very logical, reasonable approach where they're, they don't have. It, it seems to me, looking at it from an apologetic philosophical perspective, they don't have the, like the logical, yeah, the logical anchor in that religion like we do, mm -hmm. which gives. And if you don't have that logical anchor, if you don't, if you don't ever seek out the good reasons to believe what you believe and and be able to talk about why you believe something, not just a blind faith, it's always going to lead to anxiety. It's always yeah. going to lead to. It's like I can't really know. I can't really know because this is a blind faith. I just, the one thing I do know is I can't question it. So it's all in the hands of Allah. You so know? you get into it, some circular. So, and by the way, there's plenty of Christians that struggle with this too. I think sure, Christian sure. cults and Christian fringe groups but, play on this. But, but one of the differences, Sarah, is that you have, when Christianity is such a personal God, I mean, he is so personal to us. Whereas in Islam, I just found this out a few weeks ago. It really shocked me. I mean, Eschatology is admitted, admittedly, even in Christianity, something I don't spend a whole lot of time on. Mm -hmm. So why would I especially spend a lot of time on Islamic eschatology? But I'm starting to see I have to do that because it's really big for them. Mm -hmm. But we were talking about Islamic eschatology a few weeks ago, and and I come to find out, everybody in the room agreed with it. So it's like, so at the end of the day, Allah is totally separate from all of creation. Mm -hmm. And so if He created paradise, is He separate from there? Yeah. 
He's separate from there. He's not there. Like, Whoa. You're like, so even when you die, you never get into the presence of Allah. Oh, no, I could never be in the presence of Allah, even in that state. Wow. So Interesting. It's, so it's like for them, he's he's almost a total mystery except for what he has revealed, and you better not question it. So it's it's like a, it's a whole different way of thinking about it. And all yeah. of that comes down to Muhammad and yeah. the veracity of the cave experiences. Mm. And the, Muhammad. Muhammad. Well, in the Quran prophetic was written over lineage. what, like 30 years? Yeah, over the course of 30 okay. years. And just for in case anyone wants to pick it up and read it, it's not in chronological order. No. It's, it's like not. what, longest to shortest or shortest to longest? It's, it's a sort of, really bizarre. It's mixed because okay. the, the, oh, okay. one of the shortest chapters of the Quran is the first chapter. It's kind of the introduction. Yeah. Ink or pen or something like that? Hmm? Pen or the ink or something like that? Uh, it, anyway, I okay. think. I'll, anyway. Al-Fatiha, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but there the is the doctrine of yeah, abrogation, yeah. which I think is important mm-hmm. because that explains, I think, a lot of the modern conflicts mm-hmm. within Islam, which is that later stuff yeah. outweighs. Well, that's what about, yeah. Oh. See, no, no, no. I, it's great. I didn't give him my list ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. But because I do want to get to, you mentioned Sharia law. People are hearing terms like Sharia law, jihad. Um, I know the word jihad technically means like just the struggle and it can be a lot of different yeah. things. But talk to us a little bit about how Islamic ideology and or their scriptures lead to some of the stuff that we're hearing today. Maybe define or describe jihad and then define Sharia so that we understand kind of where some of these people are starting to come from that we're seeing in the news. Yeah, I actually um, lately went down a rabbit hole on jihad a little bit, trying to study it, trying to understand it better, because there's a there's this popular idea right now in jihad where there's a lesser and greater jihad. And so jihad just like clearly means struggle. I mean, it's just a struggle against something. So come to find out... Um, I had to make some notes on this because <laughs> it's it like trying to remember all these names and stuff. It's it's kind of um, it's daunting. It, it is sure. daunting. Like yeah, so I'm, I'm just not far enough along to you almost have to learn Arabic to even start understanding some of this stuff. But See, it's, this is why we have you come and test us. So we don't have to <laughs> so, learn Arabic. So yeah, so the problem with the Quran was it was primarily oral. Okay, yeah. so you have this oral thing. So and there were situations that were happening around Muhammad. That gives context to the Quran. Mm-hmm. So in Medina, it was mostly kind of peaceful and mm-hmm. time there. And, you know, and he's getting things going and nobody really saw him as a threat. And they had this yeah. like fringe little group over here doing what they're doing. And, you know, he's interacting with Muslims and Jews. Everybody's getting along. It's like, hey, this guy's, you know, just like we would. It's like he's trying to figure out. Christians and Jews. I'm sorry. Yeah. Christians yeah, and Jews. Yeah, correct. He's trying to figure out the truth. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about, you know, and, and all this. But. You know, you look back at it, it was very like a Nestorian version of Jesus almost. Or is like, what does that mean? You know, like Jesus. Sorry, was if you're going to use a big word like that on the podcast, I have yeah, to Yeah, Jesus you. is a great guy, but he's not God in the flesh. Got it. You know, you know that kind of idea, which is a yeah. very popular belief in the Middle East in that time, too. So, it's popular you know. belief now. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and um, so, yeah, as he's interacting, nobody really, you know, and then. So the Quran says certain things about, you know, how how like we need to respect the people of the book and things like that. He mm-hmm. called Christians people of the book, Jews people of the book. And then wartime came mm-hmm. and all those things started happening um, around them. So you had like I, I made a note here like, um, you know, so regarding non-believers, you have Surah al-Baqarah, the Surah 2. The surahs are like chapters. Yeah, the chapter yeah. 2 of the Quran where... Um, Muhammad writes, there shall be no compulsion in religion. The right way has become distinct from the wrong way. Whoever announces evil and believes in God has grasped the most trustworthy handle, which does not break. God is hearing and knowing. So you see he's just like... It's nice enough. Yeah, generic, nice enough. But Islamic scholars, some Islamic scholars, now not not all of them, because there's like different theories of abrogation and different ways that people approach this. There's a diversity of thought with, within Islam that's about as vast as Christianity mm-hmm. when it comes to some of the stuff. So I'm not saying this to represent every Muslim in the world at all, by any stretch of imagination, but the way abrogation works is so Muhammad, Muhammad recited this at one point, then few you know few years later something else happened and so the revelation is going to have to change so mm-hmm. here's surah 9 uh, verse 29 so al al taba for or al taba for those for our muslim friends that may be listening um most by, by the way the reason i say that is most muslims 
do not say like Suriname. Oh, they have like it we memorized do. by the title, which is okay. Al Sahaba. So, okay. but it says there, Muhammad changes changes his mind about this and says, "Fight those who do not believe in God, nor in the last day, nor forbid what God and His Messenger has have forbidden, nor abide by the religion of truth for among those who receive the Scripture until they pay the due tax willingly or unwillingly." So there, you it's see, a little like, less friendly. Yeah, he's not yeah. nearly as friendly there, <clears throat> and so. We don't want to mischaracterize history because that's not going to get us to the truth. I mean, there's a history that we all want to believe of these Muslim crusaders with the big sharp swords sure. and cutting off heads as they're riding, just don't, not even stopping through North Africa and all this. But actually, um, what history tells us is a little bit different story. I mean, they, they were definitely like these crusades and things that happened. Uh, in the name of jihad, that was very much a religious war, thanks to these kind of things abrogating each other. You keep you guys have both used that word, but just for our listeners, abrogation is just this idea that the yeah. things that were written later carry more weight than the things that were written exactly. earlier. Yeah. Okay. And so when you take this verse seriously, what happened was, yeah, the Muslim armies came, and those that didn't convert were either killed or taxed to the place where they, they couldn't really live. Survive. Yeah. So what happens is, and this is uh, this should really light a fire under the Christians listening to this, is that the reason a lot of those people didn't convert, or, or the people that converted to Islam, they had two things in common. Can you guess what they were? They were they were not Trinitarian, and they did not believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. So they had taken what we would call Christian heresies. They were Christian heretics in the first place, mm -hmm. and they did not. And lastly, one more thing, they did not have a Bible in their language. So when the Muslims came, they're like, pay this tax or become a Muslim. They're like, well, what do you guys Easy believe? Choice. Yeah. Well, that, that God is one. There is no trinity like you Christians believe. Like, well, we don't believe in that either. Yeah. Jesus is not God in the flesh. Hey, hey more board. in common. Yeah. And uh, here's, you know, you're going to learn Arabic and have God's word in your hand. And he's like, okay, we've always wanted God's word in our hand. Oh. So we're, so yeah, it's, yeah, so yeah. It like that was going on too. And we don't ever think about that. So that uh, like those that have this. Like you're sitting there listening to this saying, I want to reach more Muslims. Maybe he's calling you to a place that needs more Christian missionaries <laughs> to yeah. go teach the truth. Because it's a pretty big epidemic right now in um, in the missionary world that the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the New Apostolic Reformation people, they're sending missionaries by yep. the tens every day. And yep. it's like Orthodox Christians are like, well. Gotta catch up. We yeah, like, but I, I want to anyway. speed us along so, because we have just a few minutes and we haven't even gotten to the modern war. So let's, so jihad can mean a variety of things, but like we have this idea from watching movies and stuff that you get like various amounts of virgins if you, I don't fly a plane into a twin tower. Like what? Mm -hmm. what seventy two. Seventy two virgins. Okay, it's a lot of virgins. What? Where, where does that come from? I didn't put that question in the notes, so maybe you weren't expecting it. Like, yeah, no. It's um, I want to say that that has more to do with a Hadith tradition than a Quranic tradition. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's where and there's Hadith abrogations too. So right. I mean, one one Hadith like a later Hadith or the way the Hadith abrogation works is how authentic is this Hadith? Like how I've, close is it to yeah. the wife that like carried it out yeah. and all that kind of stuff? I have a dear friend who's a Muslim that's getting her master's degree in Sharia law, which is, or, well, she did her undergrad in Sharia, I think, and now she's getting her master's degree in um, Hadith scholarship, Hadith science, it's called. So how do you determine how, like, text, it's like a textual criticism mm -hmm, approach. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you determine which of these 500,000 writings about Muhammad are actually true to, right. to him and, you know, like have a lineage? And so, yeah, so that's that's where a lot of that comes from, a lot of those ideas. And a lot of these fringe groups that we're seeing in the, in the um, and I call them fringe groups because there's a big difference between what we would call, like we tend to group all Muslims into this one big group. Mm -hmm. But I've found out that geographically, when I talk to a Turkish Muslim, Pakistani Muslim, and an Egyptian Muslim, mm -hmm. I'm going to get three different kinds of, of mm -hmm. Islam and three different kinds of these emphasis. So there's like a geographical approach to this mm -hmm. religion. And then beyond that, there are geopolitical institutions like the, the uh, Salafis who have basically infiltrated Eastern Africa, East Africa, and, hmm. and um, 
Um, they're the ones that are funding things. I'm pretty sure it's the Salafis who are funding things like Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, mm -hmm. and these and these um, terrorist or Al Qaeda and these terrorist organizations and things. So wait, so, so most people think of Muslims for the majority of them being Sunni and Shia. Yeah. You know, so what are what are those? What are those well, are like Sunni, denominations, sort of yeah. like? Well, in a sense, yeah. I mean, and and it's a historical divide. It's a okay. Sunni and Shia divided shortly after the death of Muhammad. Okay. Um, one group followed uh, the Shia. One of the wives. Shia followed, the Shia group followed Ali, which was mm -hmm. his son-in-law. Okay. And then, um, yeah, one of the wives, which was, uh, yeah, um, the most famous one, Aisha, was, I think, the Sunnis is where they. Um, She's not the nine-year-old, though. She, yeah, she was the. Uh, child bride. Was, the child bride of, of Muhammad. Okay. Yeah. Well, we are all nine at one point, Sarah. Yes, but we were not all married when we were nine okay. to a prophet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so we have these different factions. That one is a historical divide. Some others, I'm sure, are more ideological. So the, here's the big question of the day. And again, you and I may not exactly see eye to eye on this, but the stuff that we're seeing, the terror that we're seeing right now in the Middle East, are those Muslims trying their best to follow the Quran and the Hadith? Or are they just have they lost their minds and they're doing something <laughs> crazy outside? Because <clears throat> you start to think about like, um, like if we put this in Christian terms, sometimes people will sort of get yelled at for being a fundamentalist because they're trying to go back to the fundamentals of Christianity. Yeah. So some people say, well, they're actually the ones that understand Christianity the best, and they're trying to be obedient. So let's not yell at them about it. Let's mm -hmm. just recognize that they're trying to really follow what it says in the Bible. Can that be same thing be said about some of these Muslim extremists that they're genuinely trying to live out what Allah wants them to do. I, I'm asking, I'm asking a lot of you here and you might not feel comfortable answering the question, but no, it's, it's fine. I mean, um, I'm glad to answer that question because I think, um, I think that uh, like, as I said, I've been doing this deep dive in, in jihad and, and what it all means and historically what it was and its foundations. It wasn't until later in Islam, that they, there's this division about what jihad actually means, okay. and so we've got to understand that that there there are places in the Quran that sort of point to that jihad is there's a greater jihad, which is a Sufi tradition, mm -hmm. which they're they're kind of you've got your Sunni, Shia, and Sufi are the three mm -hmm. biggest groups, and Sufis are more mystical, they're more peaceful usually, but there are a lot of Sufi wars too, to be fair, but they have a more personal sense of, of God's presence and things mm. like that. So they, they're a little bit different thinkers. So think of them as like the, the gentle aesthetic monks of, yes. of the Islam. So they saw jihad. They really tried to sanitize it more in the 9th and 10th century. And they, they talked about this greater and lesser jihad. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't implicit. It was implicit at first and then explicitly, later a couple centuries later but the way they saw jihad and the way a lot of western muslims see jihad is more of that sufi tradition now it's it's trickled into sunni and shia as well that your primary battle is against yourself your flesh think of like romans 12 1 and 2 kind mm -hmm. of kind of jihad like which is admirable which is good man you versus do that. man man versus himself these yeah. are yeah <clears throat> but historically jihad was most certainly a holy war it was most certainly um um, a war in the name of Allah. Mm -hmm. And I think what we have to understand today is when we talk about this in the geopolitical world, when we're talking about, say, for instance, um, and this, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with my Middle Eastern friends about this. And you have to ask them, is, was Operation Enduring Freedom, you know, the, the Iraqi-Afghani mm -hmm. war that we were in, they would not consider that jihad. Like, that's not jihad. That's a global conflict. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between a governmental global conflict sure. and a war in the name of Allah. Now, what we're seeing here today... That's what I'm trying to get with, at. <clears throat> ...with Israel versus Palestine is that there is, there's actually a divide about this that I've seen, um, at least from... Well, I can say from Western and, and Middle Eastern Muslims. I mean, I mean... I, they won't care. They they won't care at all that I would share like some of my Middle Eastern Muslim friends. Like I had a Middle Eastern Muslim friend tell me not too long ago, Sarah, that she she wished that 
she could be abducted by Hamas because they are so good to their their captives. They're so good to those that they that they capture. Mm. And I'm like, gosh, wow. And you know, in, in her her eyes, this thing in the Middle East is so just. It's so justified mm-hmm. that the only real solution is to completely shut down Israel. Mm-hmm. And so that's somebody that's in Jordan. Yeah. I talked to another Jordanian friend, you know, and they're from the same exact city. And this is a friend who lost 24 people in Mm. one night, 24 people of their Mm -hmm. family in one night. And I asked them, like, honestly, what are you thinking about this? And they're like, there's a huge fog of war. There's lies on both sides. And we're not going to know how all this is going to turn out until the dust settles. Are you pro Hamas? Of course not. They bring this stuff on people. You know, it's like, so it's like to be Palestinian, and they're and they're Palestinian. They're mm-hmm. of Palestinian descent. So maybe sometimes for some people, to be pro Palestinian means to be anti Hamas. You know, because they're looking at this as like we're not Hamas, but we're bearing the brunt of these missiles because of them, mm-hmm. and we hate them. Let me ask so, you this. So yeah, sadly we only have a couple minutes left. Put as much as we don't want to do this, just for a second, let's put ourselves in the mind of the Hamas soldiers. Do they think, like, how are they justifying the horrible acts they're doing? And they are continuing to be gung ho. We're doing the right thing. Where are they getting that from? I, they're, I'm certain they're getting it from their their interpretation of the text and the yeah. Quran, and and the example that Muhammad set. And and it's um, it's just. It's part of it's part of the religion, to be honest. I mean, it really is. You can't deny it. It's 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 just part of um, you know. It's 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 part of their their struggle with the world. There's their the the Western influence, the pornographic Western vulgar influence upon their children. You know, they just yeah. There's a billion ways they can justify that. And know, but, but but the first is it just? I'm not saying it's just. No, not. gosh, no. I'm, I know you're I'm not. saying I'm saying that like. In their mind, they see Israel as a gateway to Western influence. That was my question. And, Why and Israel? Then, okay. And then on top of that, um, a group of people that is supposedly oppressing their country and is oppressing their people and all of that. So, I mean, they see that's that's their mindset. Yeah. So it's like, how do you... Um, how do you put yourself in their shoes? I don't know that we possibly could put, their, put ourselves in their shoes. I do think that we ought to... Be compassionate, knowing that this is a group of people that, even though Hamas was completely unjustified for doing what they did at that music that conf, uh, concert, yeah. and um, you know I've watched several biographies and watched how that all went down, and then I'll turn around and talk to a uh, try to get some information like how how do I talk about this like like what I, what exactly happened here and be as informed as possible, knowing that I'm talking to people from this perspective on a you know every other day basis almost. And then you ask them about it, and they're like, well, that actually wasn't Hamas. That was Israel. They staged yep. every bit of that. And what you're seeing here with this is like, how do we think about this Christianly? Um, we have to be careful about how we characterize enemies here because, first of all, Jesus told us to love our enemies. That doesn't mean to give yeah, them a Yeah, I know. I really pass. don't love that part sometimes, <laughs> yeah. but he did say that. And even if you see them as an enemy, try to reach out to them mm-hmm. because one of the best things you can do to disarm all of this is show people the love of Jesus That's right. and show people who like who we are as Christians. Like, mm-hmm. Because I'll tell you this, um, somewhat candidly, I won't bring up their name, but one of my Muslim friends, like in their anger with all this going on, I, I just, they started almost yelling, like, I don't see how Jesus, how you Christians have ever followed the command to love your enemies. I don't even mm. see how it's possible. And, I, you know, in their anger and rage of all this, like, I can see that. Then at the same time, I can see how Hamas, what we don't know about Hamas, is they're actually a, uh, there's a, there's a wing of them that's a humanitarian association. Like they have this humanitarian wing that builds hospitals, schools, brings in teachers, nurses, doctors, and all that stuff. Then they have a military wing that does what they do. The problem with that, those two things collide, and so their military base may be built underneath one of these hospitals. Uh, for sure. Or is. Yeah. So it's like, it's like there's so much mess, mm-hmm. you know, going on with all of this. It's like. What you just about have to lean on is <clears throat> understand understand your neighbor, understand their theology, understand your scriptures, and understand that, you know, the 
people normally in the West that we're encountering are not of this group. Matter of fact, when these kind of things happen, you know, I love asking this question to Muslims. Like, what what were your thoughts on the, you mm-hmm. know, I was I was a uh, senior in high school when 9-11 mm-hmm. happened. And what do you think of that? And some of the people I've talked to is like, well, I wasn't alive at that time because they're college students or something. But my parents absolutely cannot stand Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, all those mm-hmm. people. Because for them, they see it as like, man, when these people do this stupid stuff over there <laughs> and it gets on the news, it makes their life totally miserable. For sure. Know? And all we want to do is just get along and manage my business and sure. retire early. And that's why that's what I'm here to do. Well, and, <laughs> so. and we don't sadly have time to get into, I mean, there's so much nuance between different Muslims all over the world, mm-hmm. what they believe, why they believe it. I mean, same could be said about Christians, but I, I feel like I kind of want to end on this note that when you have Muslims in sort of disbelief that we could love our enemies, yeah, you know, they're, they're right about something. And what they're right about is that we cannot yep. love our enemies on our That's own. That's my answer too. And it, but but the thing that the reason why we can is something that I don't think Muslims have, and you can disagree with this if you want. I don't think that you will. Christians have a different kind of love coming from our what I believe is the true God, hmm. because it is Trinitarian, because you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living in perfect harmony in this sort of dance. Um, where there yeah. is so much love within them that poured out when they created the world and created humanity, poured out on us in creation, poured out on us in the rescue effort to bring us back. That kind of love is only found in one religion and it's Christianity. Mm-hmm. And we can then be the participants in and the receivers of that kind of love. And then because of that through us, we actually have the capacity to maybe yeah. love our enemies. Well, I, I'll just say this, whenever I'm training people to do evangelism on college campuses, I make sure to tell them, don't ask God to give you more love or more patience because you don't need more of your love and patience because your (laughs) love and patience is flawed. I said, you have the opportunity to receive in its fullness the fruit of the Spirit, Mm -hmm. love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I've said that in front of many, many Muslims, the same thing, and and I'll get to that in a minute. I said, you know, and that is the difference. I told my friend that, too, and he was saying, how can you forgive? How can you? It's like, because that's one of the last things Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for you know not what they're doing. And like, I can't love people like that. I'm way too selfish to love people like that. But when I recognize my blind spots and my selfishness, I can say, God, I don't want more of my love. I want an impartation of your love in my heart. I mean, yeah. I, help me to love this person that's so unlovable. And I think we need more of that. So long story short, when I say that and I and I recite that fruit of the Spirit to a lot of my Muslim friends, I almost get the same reaction. They say, that's a beautiful list. Mm-hmm. So, it is a beautiful so, list. So it's like, that's is that in Scripture somewhere? <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, let me show you right now. <laughs> Well, okay, so let's say some people are listening and they want to find out more about this thing you're doing where you're studying the Bible and Quran. Is that open to other people? Can they come and do that? Yeah, it, it is. Um, I would say just just reach out to me. I, you know, I don't. How can people find you? That's where I was going with that. Yeah, yeah. So you can reach out to me. I'm, a, of course, on social media. You can just find me on there. You know, Bill Scott is my name. We also just started a, um, a ministry called The Truth Conversation that's been going for about a couple of weeks now that you can find us on YouTube or interviewing people and doing things like this, having the great conversation, continuing the great conversation. I'm very yeah. passionate about that. It's talking about stuff that matters. You can find us on there, um, or I will give you my email, which is just Whoa. my name, Whoa. Bill Scott at RatioChristi.com, which is R-A-T-I-O-C-H-R-I-S-T-I.org. So awesome. there it is. Reach well, out to me. I'd be glad to. And if you disagree with this, if you agree with it, if you're bothered by it, that's why I give my information to people because I want you to reach out. You yeah. know, if I'm wrong, tell me because I certainly don't want to do that again. You and know? Bill is so. just about the nicest guy. If you go to his office, he will have pastries and coffee for you. And um, If I know you're coming. I'll always <laughs> yes. have coffee. The pastries were, yeah. <laughs> Those were extra. Okay. <laughs> um, but if you want to know more about Bill, you know where to find him. If you want to know more about Theology by the Pint, uh, you can go to theologybythepint.org and we invite you to come to our events. Tell us what you want to hear more of. Tell us what who we need to have on the podcast and all that kind of jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, but until we see you next time, we encourage you as always to question freely, think deeply, and disagree as needed.